I went through the same thing. I finally had it retitled in California to me. Right. <laughs> and then retitled it in Florida. Well, the problem is that my cousin is in California. So I'm like, the title is so hard. I'm so happy to be in the world of my first world of love. Yeah. Okay. Just need to make it through the divorce. Mask, it doesn't matter. What's that? You got a mask on, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to call back to order the Pasco County Board of County Commission meeting for September 21st, 2020. And also remind everyone to silence your cellular de devices at this time, as well as if we can mute our microphones. We're not speaking. We're going to go ahead and proceed with the public hearing agenda, starting with item P1 ordinances. Madam Clerk, do we have proof for item P1? Yes, item P1 was published in the Tampa Bay Times June 24th, 2020. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Denise Hernandez, Planning and Development. Item P1 is PDD 20 0755, and this is the adoption hearing on this item. It's an ordinance amending the Pasco County Comprehensive Plan, providing for a large-scale comprehensive plan amendment to the future land use maps, map 2-15 and sheet 04, changing from res 3 to res 6, <clears throat> excuse me, on approximately 37.77 acres of real property located on the east side of Colony Road, south of Fairwinds Road, approximately half a mile north of State Road 52, with associated sub-area policy, future land use 7.1.54, Colony Road, and an amendment to the future land use sub-area map 2-954, Colony Road, providing for repealer severability and an effective date. Uh, today, we ask that you adopt this ordinance by roll call vote. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions before I go to public comment? Any questions from the board? No questions? Okay, this is a public hearing. Madam Clerk, do we have anybody signed up via WebEx or any emails in reference to this item? For P1, no one has on the WebEx link and there's no email. Excellent. Okay, do we have anybody? There should be an applicant for this, however. Okay. I didn't see him on there, so. Well, hold on, I, I still get it. I didn't get it asked if there's anybody at the kiosk. Sorry. Is anybody at the kiosk? There is nobody at the kiosk. All right, does the applicant have anything to say, or would you like us to go ahead and move forward? I didn't see. I didn't, is there anybody else, anybody on there? I'm here, Mr. Chairman. Barbara Will height on oh, behalf hey. of the applicant. I've been recognized. Um, we support staff's recommendations. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions for the applicant? Seeing that it is, back to the board. Mm -hmm. Second. A motion and a second. This is a roll call vote. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. I don't think she's on. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 4 0. Thank you. All right, give me one sec here. Okay, so now we're going to go ahead and move on to the Commissioner Moore, I did vote yes. I, Commissioner Moore, I did vote yes. Okay, I, we couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. No. All right, we'll jot it down. 
Thank you. Now we're going to proceed with the procedures for rezonings. Mr. County Attorney, Mr. Steinsnyder, please review the procedures for rezonings. Mr. Chairman, I'll be happy to. There are two rezoning agendas, regular and consent. Staff will present each application to the Board of County Commissioners. If staff or planning commission has recommended approval and there's no opposition, the application will be considered by the board without further presentation. If staff or planning commission has recommended denial or if there is opposition to the application, the applicant will be given five minutes for presentation. The opposition will be given three minutes for each individual or five minutes for a group representative, and the applicant will be given three minutes for rebuttal. Any individual disagreeing with staff or planning commission recommendation or anyone wishing to object to any condition of the rezoning may at this time request a petition be pulled from the consent agenda, in which case that application will be heard under the regular agenda later on during the meeting. Otherwise, all rezoning applications on the consent agenda will be approved by a single motion and vote. If you wish to speak to any petition, please give your name and address and whether or not you've been sworn for the record. These are quasi-judicial public hearings. The law in Florida is that mere public support or opposition of an application is insufficient for this board to take action. Please limit your comments to those criteria found within the board's land development code. All right, thank you so much. Today we have five public hearings on the consent agenda. These items will be approved by one vote without a presentation unless there is someone here in objection. Those that are pre-registered are at the public comment kiosk to speak to any of the items on the public hearing agenda. Prior to speaking, you'll be sworn in by the clerk. So at this time, Madam Clerk, um, for the list provided, if you could swear in each person individually per agenda. I don't actually, I don't like that. Let's just go ahead and do them all at once. Okay. If you are here to speak on the um, public hearing items, please raise your right hand. Right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give is the truth? So help you God. Okay. I'm pretty sure everybody said I do. Okay. Ms. Fernandez. Item P2. Item P2 was published in the Tempe Times August 19th, 2020. P2 is PDD 20 CU 36, conditional use and operating permit. Cypress Preserve A41 LLC, Land Excavation and MPUD Master Plan Unit Development District comes to you with a recommendation to continue to the 10-620 BCC meeting at 1.30 in Dade City. Yeah, I do have, before we take a motion, I do have to ask for public comment. No, not on the, the I thought you it was asked somebody that. It was advertised, this was advertised as a continuance. Oh, it was advertised as a continuance. Yeah. Well, there we go. That's even better. Motion to continue 10 Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Mariano. I have a second by Commissioner Oakley to continue this item to a time certain. On 10 6 in Dade City at 1 30. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. P3 is being withdrawn. I'd like to state the publication Please record. Uh, P, item P3 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on June 24th, 2020. Thank you. You can read the title with was withdrawn if you want. PDD 20 CU 20, um, it, CNRV Enterprises LLC, T-Mobile Reliant Towers. This was withdrawn by the applicant, so no action is required today. Okay, thank you. Okay, P4, moving on with the consent. Madam Clerk, please uh, read the publication. Read the publication yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, P4 was published in the Tampa Bay Times, August 19th, 2020. P4 is PDD 27352, Palm Materials, MPUD, Master Plan Unit Development, RBR Properties of West Florida, LLC. It's a rezoning request from AC Agricultural District, C2 General Commercial District, and I1 Line Industrial Park District to an MPUD Master Plan Unit Development District to allow the construction of an in industrial material sorting facility, 500,000 square feet of industrial and 150,000 square feet of commercial on approximately 65.71 acres. Comes to you with a recommendation of approval with conditions from the Planning and Development Department and the Planning Commission. Thank you. Do we have anybody on WebEx signed up to speak on this item? No one has signed up on WebEx to speak to this item. Email. Or email. No? No. Nope. Anybody at the kiosk to speak to item <laughs> P4? <laughs> There's nobody at the kiosk for that item. Okay, thank you. Leave on consent. P5. That publication, please. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> and now we're like in, we're a little lost up here today. Right? There's a lot of a lot of things going on. <laughs> item P5 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on August 26, 2020. P5 
MPDD 27494, Paul F. and Beverly A. Reinsmith, is for a change in zoning from MPUD, Master Plan Unit Development District, to an AR, Agricultural Residential District. Comes to you with a recommendation of approval from the Planning and Development Department and the Planning Commission. Thank you. Uh, is there anybody signed up to object to this item via WebEx email? No one has signed up for P5, WebEx, or email. Anybody at the kiosk? There is nobody at the kiosk for that item. All right, thank you. No objection, leave on consent. P6, I know we have somebody signed up, if I'm not correct, so before we get to it, um, we do have somebody, I think, at the, at the kiosk. Okay, go ahead and read the um, okay. publication, please. Yes, uh, it was published, P6 was published in the Tampa Bay Times, August 26, 2020. Okay. P tw PDD 20, 7494, 7495 rather, Earl J. Bartholomew, change in zoning from AR Agricultural Residential District an AC Agricultural District and a C2 General Commercial District to a C2 General Commercial District comes to you with a recommendation of approval from the Planning and Development Department and the Planning Commission. Thank you. So do we have anybody in addition on WebEx or any emails? No one has signed up on WebEx and no emails okay. on this item. So we do have one person at the kiosk if um, that states they would like to object to this item. Go ahead and just, um, for the record, if you could pull that up real quick, at the kiosk. For the name. record, the person right. at the kiosk is Mr. Bartholomew, who's the applicant. Oh, okay, so nobody in objection to this item. Okay. I mean, no, let's yeah. double check just in case. Okay. Here's, here's <laughs> no Mr. Bartholomew on the screen. Okay. No objections, just here if there's any questions. Okay, so we do not have anybody here that object to this item. So with that, we will leave it on consent. Thank you. Uh, P7. Item P7 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on August 26, 2020. PDD 27498, in the name of Brandon Ray Sotomayor, for a change in zoning from AC Agricultural District to an AR Agricultural Residential District. The applicant has voluntarily agreed to record a deed restriction limiting it to two lots and one residential dwelling unit on each lot. Uh, comes to you with a recommendation of approval from the Planning and Development Department and the Planning Commission. Thank you. Do we have anybody sign up via WebEx or any emails in objection? Do we? No, no one no. signed up via WebEx or email. Anybody at the kiosk? Yeah. There is nobody at the kiosk for that item. All right, we'll leave that on consent. P8. Item P8 was published in Tampa Bay Times on August 23rd, 2020. This item is an, um, a transmittal item to the DEO. PDD 20739, it's a large scale comprehensive plan amendment, CPAL 2009, for the Trinity Corporate Center. Transmittal of proposed large scale comprehensive plan amendment to the future land use map 2-15 and sheet 19, changing from IL industrial light to PD plan development on approximately 65 acres of real property, a tax amendment creating sub area policy, future land use 7.1.55, Trinity Corporate Center, and, amend and an amendment to the future land use map 2-9, adding sub area map 2-955 tri Trinity Corporate Center. Again, this is just a uh, transmittal that you authorize transmittal to the Department of Economic Opportunity and other reviewing agencies. Thank you, ma'am. Do we have anybody signed up in objection to this item on either WebEx or email? No one on WebEx or email. Anybody at the kiosk? There is nobody for that item at the kiosk. Okay. With that, we'll leave on consent, and I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. A motion by Commissioner Oakley, a second by Commissioner Mariano. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you. Now we're going to move on to the regular public hearing items. Each one will be presented by staff and the applicant. I will call for public comment on each one of those. And we have one P9. P9. Yes. Item P9 was published in the Tampa Bay Times on August 16th, 2020 and August 23rd, 2020. Good afternoon, Joanne Revita, Real Property and Planning. The Real Property team has received a petition to vacate a portion of a platted drainage and access easement filed by Shoshanka Kempfel. Petitioner has requested the vacation for the purpose of constructing a deck and is requesting to vacate only five feet of the 15 foot easement. There were no objections to this petition. The team recommends approval. Thank you. Any questions? Questions? Comments? No? Okay. Mr. Chairman, yes. I do have a question. Go ahead. Was the CDD contacted about this easement? Yes, it was. Uh, they executed a, um, an encroachment easement for the um, petitioner to build his deck. All right. So you, but you didn't upload that in Desire? I did not. Okay. 
but so the CDD has no objection to their to their easement being vacated. That is correct. Okay. Okay. Do we have anybody sign up via WebEx or email? The applicant uh, has signed up through WebEx, and that's all. Yeah. Okay. Great. Do we have anybody at the kiosk? There is nobody at the kiosk for this item. Okay. Would the applicant like to uh, comment on this item? Or answer any questions? He was here just for a matter of if, if there were questions. Okay. Seeing no, I move for approval. Second. second. A motion and a second. I have a motion by Commissioner um, Wells, and I think I got a second by Commissioner Oakley. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. Thank you for that. And we do have one more item remaining, but that will come back to us at 5.15 for all you on your edge of your seats at home watching this. Um, so we will go back to our, let me say, is it R3? R3. R3. Let's go back to R3 and continue that. All right. Good afternoon. Justin Grant. Director, Public, Public Infrastructure, Fiscal and Business Administration. This is the continuation of R3 earlier this afternoon, presenting dredging options. I'll wait here for a moment to pull up the presentation. We have some visual aids for you guys. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, uh, so the aim here is to generally define the benefiting areas for assessment, right? So indirect to direct benefiting. So going right to left on that map there, uh, you're looking at the section B there in yellow, uh, going to section A. Um, dividing lines there are west of Little Road and west of US 19. And the two smaller areas there pictured is Hudson and Gulf Harbors. Those are, you guys are familiar with those boundary lines. And then the table here to the left gives you a, a pictorial of how many uh, parcels are in each one of those areas. Uh, and if you add Hudson and Gulf Harbors, that makes the fifth uh, division of areas. Uh, recognize there's li limitations to this analysis. This slide and the very next slide is for illustration and estimation purposes only. Um, if the board should move to, choose to move forward, um, any special assessment district would require legal definitions for the exact benefits and, and assessments. Next slide, please. So this slide is put together here to give everything um, on a $1 million uh, cost of construction. So everything on an incremental basis, this is basically um, perspective to look at what that would cost uh, from the different units. On an MSTU for west of Little Road, you're looking at about $225, uh, $450 for the MSTU west of 19, MSBU looking at $375. Uh, for that area, and then a combined MSU, S, MSBU, this would be Gulf Harbors and, um, and Hudson put together. That would be 1875. Obviously, that number is larger due to the smaller uh, number of parcels contained within that. Um, and you have the millage, the top two uh, there um, are MSTUs, those use millage methodology, and the bottom two are MSBUs that use flat assessments. Okay, I believe that is the Great. Branford can bring us up to wrap up. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. I'm Branford Adumwa, Public Ways Director. So what are the next steps? We will pursue grants to help reduce the cost of the project. Please note most grants require matching funds on our part. We'll bring back before the board an assessment methodology and rate for a MSBU or MSTU based on commission direction today. We do recommend an MSBU for an assessment methodology for this project. We will meanwhile secure temporary funding in public works for the permitting and design of the project. The funds will be reimbursed later. We will also need one full-time project management position in public works to manage dredging projects. Permitting design and procurement for completing the project will take between 18 to 24 months. And this concludes our presentation. Uh, if you have any further questions, we are available to address them. Well, before I, if you don't want me to ask a question, you're stating that the time to permit, design, 
in the procurement is 25 months. So do we have a guesstimate on the advice from the consultant on how long the project itself would take? For the construction? Correct. Six months, six months, yes. Oh, wow, so okay. So 25 for the permitting side, but only six months to construct, okay. Commissioner Mariana. Um, and I, this is early in the stage, and I think if you heard the presentation today when we talked about the coastal restoration, uh, all day, taking back the jurisdiction of DEP, is a huge game changer from all the numbers that we've seen already. Uh, if we can take back jurisdiction, We'll save a lot of that permitting time and cost. Um, and talking to the consultant, he agrees 100%. That's the time to go take a look at everything. So I think the, the next thing we need to do is really follow that through. Uh, they say we should be able to get that permit uh, answer within 30 days. Uh, and I think from there, we can then go take a closer look to where we're at. Uh, part of the reason we wanted DBA to stop was because once you initiate a permit with DEP, you have to stick with it. We didn't want to have that interview, didn't want to have that meeting, and that's why they kind of stopped where they're at. But it's going to be very easy to pick up and go from there. Um, one thing I will say is the uh, chair of the, of the research committee, when we do the approvals of the pot one money for the first allocation and the pot three money, uh, everyone said they thought bridging was a good application of that money. I, I, I think the committee will still feel that way. We do need to get it before them at some point, but I don't think we're ready even for that yet because we don't know how the number's going to play out. Um, the aquatic preserve was a big conversation we had this spring on what legislation is passing that through. If the DEP approves what we're pulling back, 99% of everything we talked about and we're worried about that aquatic preserve will go away. It will come under this as a existing channel already. It simplifies that whole process. So I think we can take all that permitting process, and now it's on us, that permitting might be able to get done within two or three months, just doing it internally. Uh, I think it's good to look at the NFPU, and Mike, you've heard before. The, uh, the brilliance of your paving assessments you've had done, I feel I'm being heard better now. Yes. Uh, the brilliance of what you had done with the Highlands paving assessment, where we had the whole Highlands community, different levels of service were needed up and down, and we took the whole thing, we set up nine different segments, even though it's the same MSBU. I think it's a similar approach here, because let's say if Gulf Harbors just needs, you know, 50 grand worth of work, then that's what th their share should be. If Hudson needs a bit more, then so be it, and up and down the whole coast, I think it's an easy allocation. I think it's important, and, and maybe we'll get more from OMB about this, but I think the uh, TIF is gonna be the ultimate way to go and the fairest way to go, because it'll be less impact field, but financially it could be the most lucrative. When word gets out and we start the dredging up and down this coast, and, and already I'm hearing very, very positive things up and down about they're excited about the dredging, they want to see it come quicker, uh, they want to see it happen, they know it's going to improve the neighborhood value, they know it's going to improve the up and down area. And let's face it, US-19, if it gets this boost, will be phenomenally improved. Uh, and I think you'll see a lot of great things happen just naturally. So somehow we need to work with OMB, let them figure out how we could do a tax increment financing program with this so that that can actually help pay for a lot of this cost. And we talked before this morning about there are some tweaking that needs to be done, some studies need to be done because there's already some existing TIF that we need to look and maybe separate out. So that can be a conversation maybe we can start now. Now we've kind of got some good groundwork and maybe in the next 30 days or 60 days maybe come back with a better plan to do that. But I think the MSB you would be, would be re well received. I think the TIF would be even more well received, and we might even find with Restore Act money coming out that uh, we can make this a very affordable program uh, that will benefit the citizens all over the county every step of the way. Commissioner Ballas, you had a question? All right, just a couple notes on that. You know, there are three counties that have had delegated authority from DEP, and I've looked at all the documents, and unless we get a special agreement with DEP, none of them allow them to permit their own work. So that's going to be a hurdle we're going to have to jump over. Every one of them requires their own permits to still go through DEP. So that's going to be an issue we're going to have to deal with, which may or may not help this. Furthermore, those agreements have been not just for specific things, but have been generally globally with respect to DEP permits. So uh, 
anyway, and with respect to the TIF, I'm not sure if you're referring to the current transportation TIF or a, a different one. I think they, they're going to need some clarification as to what you're referring to with respect to the TIF. Well, and this morning he came to me to talk about how oh, you can't have two TIFs in the same spot. So that may be something that does have to get dis discussed and gone through how we're going to make it happen. Um, I think for West Pasco, you know, if I had to look at transportation, do I really need a transportation mech fee or do I need dredging? I think up and down we'll say that this would be tough to be the, the way to go for it. But that's something we can take a look at. Um, as far as the purning with DEP, with what we have for pre-existing canals between before April 3rd, 1970, I think it's a discussion from what I'm hearing that we can actually segregate out what we can do. Um, I just wanted to put caution on the delegation. The delegation, if they're maintenance dredges, yeah, that's that's different than dredging a channel. But right, I'm, I'm, and that's all, that's, that's everything we're looking at right now. Everything we're talking about is just all channels existing before 1970. So I'm not looking to go outside that scope. I'm sticking to right small focus. I don't want to change anything else that SWIFTMUD's doing, DEB's doing. I want to just work on the maintenance channels so I can change the bureaucracy from just dealing with the state and the Army Corps to stick right in Pasco County. And I think we have already a coastal person already in place uh, that can start, but we can bring a dredging person on full time, which I think would be a good benefit as well to make sure these things get well. And it could be even a partial position. I don't know. We can look at it as it comes out. That's what I'm saying. I've looked at the three other delegations, mm -hmm. and none of them allow the county to, to permit themselves. If it's a maintenance channel? It, it, it's just the language is any permit done by the jurisdiction has to go to DEP. <coughs> it's flat out in every one of their agreements. So that's a, an issue we'd have to deal with on that. Anyway. Have we, sub have we submitted that, Mike? I'll have to check with staff. There are some, um, there's some more detail that we think we're going to need to add to it. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, you know, the DEP will probably come back with requests for additional information as, as we go through it. Yeah. We still have time, you know, given, mm -hmm. you know, if the direction is to continue moving with, with, the, uh, with the project, we're going to probably have to put out a solicitation for a consultant anyways, which is about a six-month process. So before we would even begin the, the <coughs> final design efforts, we can certainly work all that in parallel, which will be a good thing. So we're, we're excited about it. Staff is looking into all the historical documents, some of the work that we can build on with GPA that, that shows you know, the underwater surveys will be helpful in, in, that, in that matter. But we've got a little more information we've got to put into it for DEP. And, and again, I'm, I'm comfortable taking these next steps to go forward. The wind talking to the consultant thinks if we do get this done, it'll be a tremendous savings for us in time energy, et cetera. So I think it's something we can get done based upon what the other three have done without even doing anywhere near what they're doing. I'm just trying to look at the channels that we built pre-1970, April 3rd. I have a couple of questions, too. Um, talk to me about some of the possible grant opportunities that are out there. I know typically there is a match to it, but which ones do we think we have um, the best chance of um, acquiring? So there, there are a number of grants out there, Commissioner, to, to discuss specifics. I'm, I'm not, not really prepared to, to talk about the specific grants. There are a lot of, of opportunities, um, but each grant has its own specific narrow little thing to it, right? So some grants you may need to make sure you're doing X and not, sure. not Y. And so part of the direction that we'd be looking for from the board is to go ahead and be able to expend resources. We want to go out and put a serious effort into it, knowing that as we put together a funding mechanism, we're going to be able to say in those grant applications, yeah, we're going we're gonna to be able to come up with a match. We're going to be able to have you know, a mechanism to, to pay. So there is a little bit of, of, of uh, some start that we need. Uh, Restore is, is obviously a, uh, um, uh, an, an alternative. Uh, that, that's real money that's there. Um, but there are a number of other federal grants. It just, again, it depends on what you're going to do with the dredging spoils and the type of work that you're doing. There's a gentleman, as we all know, named Alan Rose that sends us emails on a pretty consistent basis and shows opportunities. And I did talk to Dan about some of those, and we know that some are attainable and possibly if they would have worked 20 or 30 years ago, if I'm not correct, with some of those opportunities. Some of that's attainable, and some of that is probably not permittable. Not permittable anymore. But uh, from those lists he sends, are some of those grants possible opportunities of what you're speaking of? I, on, on the surface, perhaps. Uh, on others, like, like Dan said, you know, we can't go out and create 
coastal barriers on top of sea And I understand they, they yeah. would not be allowed these days, but some of the other opportunities. Yes. I just bring that up as an example because I know he has approached us on numerous occasions and has sent multiple. So obviously he's done some, you know, some due diligence about opportunities there. So. Commissioner Mariano. Yes, and there, there are some grants. That's one that we're looking at right now with Congressman Bill Arakis office, the Chafee grant that's out there. That's a huge amount of money that we could tap into that ties right into the coastal preservation. Uh, oyster beds, uh, oyster, there's uh, all sorts of money available for that as well. So of, of forming a budgetti, as, we, as we've talked, um, these things go around. Um, the other permit is permitting of the islands will be tough, et cetera, but there's so many opportunities out there to get it for anything to improve water quality. And I think we were talking about the Venice project. I don't know if it's the same one I'm thinking of, but that was water quality funded across the board. Okay. That ties in very close to what we're doing here in the Hudson Channel, the numbers, et cetera. What we've got to do is get down to the source of what the problem is. Right. Now, just to kind of highlight, I was going to get this in the committee reports, but I'll, I'll go over it now. We had uh, nine Florida out at Hudson Beach because there was some rumors around, okay, are the pipes going under the canals and that's what's causing the leaking, et cetera, et cetera. So we went with nine Florida and I heard this before, but I wanted to get it verified. So by the way, Mike, thank you for setting up that meeting. That was, was phenomenal. Uh, they've got plastic pipe going up and down Clark Street. Uh, Harbor Drive, Old Dixie, et cetera, all brand new stuff that's not leaking whatsoever. Some stuff can get in there, but it's not causing anything that's going to get out. And there's nothing going under the canals. So one of the things we have to do is we've got to isolate where that pollution is coming from. Uh, <coughs> we find it's at the base where the shrimpers are. We find it's also, coincidentally, out by the pavilion of Hudson where Hudson Beach is. It's also on the Skeleton Key exit going out where there's a lot of bacteria there. And we we're probably going to struggle with trying to figure out exact one there. Could be boaters dropping the stuff before they kind of get inside. Okay. Yeah. When I look at Hudson Beach at low tide, and we're just kind of out there the other day when we had Nye Florida out there, I'm looking at all the birds. I mean, you had blackbirds, seagulls, you had ducks. Everybody's out there into like a feeding frenzy in that area. Well, while all the birds are there, guess what they're going to do? But they leave their poop, right? That's going to go. I think that's partly what those numbers are coming up to be. So when we go look at putting that seawall going all the way around there and raise it all up, you're not going to have that feeding frenzy anymore, and you're going to be able to control that bacteria. If we can isolate to the bacteria like they did down in Venice, we can go then get extra grant funding to say, here's what we're going to do, here's how it's going to prevent. So it is an exciting process right now, but it's going to just take a little bit more uh, uh, diagrams to go forward. Staffs, I think, already got their report that's already been sent back to DEP to what we found. And we're going to take that next step with them to work with them. But there's so much money in water quality. The governor was just talking about it this past week, how much money's out there. So water quality is critical, and that's what all these things will do going out forward. Right. And we might even find there's some silt on some of these dredges projects that's coming right from the roadway. Well, should, should, should the people have to pay for that? Or should, maybe we should look at using storm stormwater to be able to take that part out. So a lot of moving parts right now. I am excited, Mike, your team. The time we're taking, the consultant's doing a great job, so I know we're moving quickly with it, and I think the timelines you see and the costs you see are, are going to you know, all go down. But just give us a little time to keep on working it. All right. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Commissioner Oakley. So we have to, to get our permits, we have to go through DEP to get those permits. So I would, I would think we need to go after every grant we can get, and we're going to have to have matching funds with those grants. So which is the best way to um, the tax source, the MSBU or MSTU? Which is best used? So staff has recommended that we pursue the MSBU for those specific communities okay. that, are, that are being assessed. With an understanding of what that is, we, we know about what our match could potentially be, and so <clears throat> every grant would be sought to reduce that balance. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Mr. Chairman. So, yeah, Mr. Sarsen. So the MSBU is a benefit unit. We'd have to prove a that that acreage that we are levying those assessments on benefit from the project. And MSTU is a taxing unit that that we could levy an additional millage for municipal purposes, that being dredging. So one's a taxing unit, one's a benefit unit. There are strings with the benefit unit, um, but the other one is is levying additional millage. Okay. So can I, can I ask one more question? So just as a follow-up, um, I'm going to make an assumption that 
as time goes on, we'll have community meetings, meetings with the residents to make sure we get, receive their input, obviously. Um, okay, just want to make sure that, because obviously that's very important to make sure that we, <laughs> mm -hmm. that the residents, this is something they want to pursue and want to move forward with. Um, yes, we sir. know we have heard from quite a few that would, but obviously it's, yeah. obviously we want to give those, those folks the opportunity. So, so Commissioner Mariana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I will tell you from four years ago, plus now, we had that first meeting of the Sea Ranch where we had people all the way from Bailey's Bluff up to Sea Pines, right. all the different communities showing interest in this, and they've been, I'll say, excitedly waiting as we make, keep on making progress with this coming forward. Um, so I, I know that when we get to it, everybody knows um, that they're going to benefit from it, and they see willing to participate as well, uh, just looking to make sure we make the best move possible. Uh, I would like to add, when we do look at the MSBU, there's an area on Old Dixie Highway where there's a, it's not even a bridge, it's like 10 feet wide or so. There was a canal that goes right across from Hudson. Years ago, they lowered it down to now, if you're in a pontoon boat at high tide, you've got to lay down to be able to go under that bridge. There's about 250 parcels that are in there. So if we're gonna go kind of do something for improving dredging, et cetera, I think those canals should be in it as well as a separate unit from where the bridge is going back through it. And I would think that if we come to a plan, we might even for that one unit as well, to look at raising that bridge up. It'll take 200 homes that are either just can't get to the Gulf with any, any type of boat whatsoever, um, uh, other than a pontoon, to be able to go out there and boat access. You could take 250 units and all of a sudden make a prime Gulf, Gulf property that can go right into a canal. So we can add that into this mix. I think it'd be a, a good addition. I think everybody else west of 19, you can show a clear benefit for everybody. So I have another question, and this could be answered by commissioners or, or, the, or the team. Hudson Channel, <clears throat> so we're looking at the cost of possibly $7 million. Um, I know we discussed this a little bit more, but that's a, not just a benefit for the residents that are there, that live there. I mean, that's a benefit for commercial fishermen. That's a benefit to the public in general. Um, so I guess the question is, you know, when it comes to an MSBU and referring to Hudson Channel, I mean, how, mu how much should local residents be paying for that portion when there is quite a bit of a, you know, quite a bit of benefit for the, the general public too, or, com or commercial fishermen that actually don't live on the channel? areas that's a, that's a great point mm -hmm. so maybe there's something to take a look at maybe it's not quite the same high degree on the west side of 19 but mm -hmm. everybody will benefit from it right. good point yeah we can certainly <laughs> consider the commercial aspects of, of the dredging and who other other properties that may benefit from that marinas fishermen etc mr right. chairman yes give, 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 yes commissioner give me let me just follow that up real quick you know and i'm with you um so when we look at opportunities or grant opportunities, is there any type of economic grant or funding that could be tied into this? Right. I don't know offhand. The, 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 that's, certainly that's just an open yes, question. That maybe something to, not maybe. Let's look into that. So, Commissioner Starkey, go ahead, please. Well, I just wanted to say I know uh, most of the citizens I run into in Gulf Harbors are very. Uh, excited about the dredge. I know there's um, some boats that uh, can't get out. I actually heard one running run into a rock the other day. Um, as far as Hudson Channel, I would say uh, even our boat, we, we won't go in there anymore. Uh, we're very, well, we're very nervous to go in there to get gas, especially at low tide. So um, not just for commercial, for commercial fishermen located there, but boats that are traveling up and down the coast, it, it'll open that up for more economic opportunity from those boats as well. All right, very good. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Mariano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, you know, what, one really interesting thing of the, all this research we've been doing and staff, again, doing a great job, finding out that the Hudson Channel was six foot deep, 75 foot wide. When we had a dredge back in 04, we had to give up, they said, at, at 4.75 to acceptable number. We still had a whole bunch of rocks that were in there. We can't seem to find that map, but it doesn't matter. Well, we've got it all mapped out now anyway. I am very optimistic. It's 70 foot wide, six feet deep going across the board. That whole channel is going to change 
uh, in a big way that area, between safety, uh, economics as well, that are, that's going to be much, much better. So six, so I think it needs to be deeper than six feet, though. I mean, some of those larger boats, what do you think they draft? I mean, that's kind of close for some of them. That's mean low, low. Yeah, okay. And if, if I could, Chairman, and this may be something, and I, I probably should have thought about it, but I, I believe the old Hudson Channel is deeper than the new Hudson Channel. We probably ought to have had them maybe add to the scope to look at the old Hudson Channel. It's just to the north of where the one is now. Um, a lot of boats use that old channel because it's deeper and it's wider. So I'm just, I didn't really think about it, but I know there's a lot of the fishermen that com come in there by catches, or not catches, but uh, Mike's dockside up there that um, that use that. So just, it might be something where they could, they're going to sonar, it wouldn't be that much more. I, I know the contract's almost up, but just throwing it out there. It, may, it might be worth looking at, I, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there, I, you know. Commissioner Maryland. Yeah, Captain, Captain Wells, <laughs> if you would. No, I mean, I, I would like, I mean, you, we're all, you guys are all very astute as far as voting goes, but if you would, that map that we have of the uh, Army Corps, the, we get it from the Army Corps, that 75 foot deep, um, we'll make that available to everybody as well to go take a look at it. And please, get with staff, go take a look at that, and then go check those, those markers out and just kind of find out. Because I think you'll kind of want to find one marker is like really off center. We've got to change it. But if you would take a really close look at that as we go forward with this. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Any other comments? So <clears throat> now staff does need some type of direction today to move forward um, to continue to obviously spend any any uh, public funds on this. So. so I'll tell you what I've heard, and just to make sure, is that uh, the board is comfortable with, with us continuing to proceed with uh, next level design activities and, and fleshing out the, the project more, with the understanding that, that will Public Works will, will borrow those funds from somewhere within its Public Works funding um, to, to pay for it, uh, with the understanding that that would be reimbursed whenever we get to the next phase, which right now sounds like an MSBU for those specific benefiting units uh, to also consider including uh, commercial and, and those types of activities. In the meantime, we'll, we'll, we'll continue on parallel paths. I mean, that's generally what I've heard. And with the TIF as well. I'm sorry, sir, yes, of course. Yeah. And I think just for the public that's watching this today too, again, we're looking at, mul continuing to look at multiple options, multiple funding options. With the caveat for grants, of course, we're going yes, to sir. look yeah, to get as much funding we can from any type of grant from the state to the federal level. Mr. Chairman, um, in the in the BP Restore Act money as well is a very big source, and not only part one and part three to bring something, get ready for the committee, but I think this is something so broad based up and down our whole coast for water quality that the part two money, this is an ideal project for that, and especially we get the state behind us with getting some of their matching monies. We could go to, to work with that whole council to get a whole bunch more money. You might get the whole thing funded. It could be that good of a project. That would be pretty awesome. Timeline, again, just for the public that's watching, um, when can we get to the point where there's public, some type of public meeting or public engagement? Um, what, would, what would you like to do and your team like to do or complete before we get to that point? So I don't think that there's ever really a, a, you can never do community engagement uh, too late in the process or too early, I should say. Um, you know, uh, we would, we could certainly, we certainly have enough information right now that we could take a pulse. So, you know, an early community meeting over the course of the next few months is, is certainly doable. And then as we get through the, the final design phase, uh, I, would, I would probably suggest a, a second community meeting there and we can have a little more fleshed out in terms of costs. We'll know more about grants, and we can we can have we can have those discussions so folks will really understand how it will affect them economically, both in terms of valuation of their properties, as well as what they're going to end up paying in, in uh, future taxes. Right. So maybe working with your coastal commissioners to together with them to get through that process. And I th I think you know maybe the West Pasco Board of Realtors might be a good place centrally located for everybody to go to. I, we could do it here to a degree, but I think it, there's more room there to space people out. Um, I think the, I think the first one we had four years ago, we had, probably had about 60 or 70 people there. Yeah. I would expect at least that many to show up again. 
And even if we had to do two phases with the meeting, okay, you might need to do I'm, two I'm, happy, I'm happy to do that. So as soon as you think you could put an agenda item together back, we can schedule it. And we don't need that much notice, I don't think, to get, let people know. We can do a couple of them if need be. But at least, like, here's the, here's the initial one that we have coming up to, to update you where we're at. And whenever you think you can make that arrangement, I'm happy to, happy to be there and make that fit my schedule, too. Look at your capacity. Make sure you follow the, the guidelines of the 50 under, spread them out, and then maybe you yeah. said do two phases, three phases, reservations, reservations, and whoever get in the like first that. goes in the second time. Okay. Very good. Cool. Sounds like you got direction. Anything else, Mr. Miles, on this item? Not on that item. Okay. Okay, great. So that does it for regular agenda, and we're going to move on to miscellaneous, and I will start with Commissioner Oakley. Okay. Um, I guess I got a question for the other commissioners. It seems like in my district, um, I have some issues come up about our landscape ordinance, and the fact of it is when you take a small business and going through COVID and everything they're doing, they're trying to, um, this particular one business trying to fix an outside area for people to be able to wait because it's a very small restaurant. And um, with that addition and putting a new roof on it, I guess it's triggered, and maybe Mr. Chairman could answer this, it's triggered that they have to upgrade all their uh, landscaping. And for a small business like I'm talking about, it seems like the cost of upgrading their landscape is just very, very expensive and makes it prohibitive from them to be able to, you know, clean up their business and uh, to help themselves. Um, I, has any of the other members found out that the landscape ordinance has affected some of these businesses and it's too extreme? I think it's right for some businesses, but your old mom and pop and those, those type businesses, a lot of times those lots are very small and there's hardly room for that type of landscape. So I'm not saying they don't do anything, but it just seems like an overabundance of landscape. So. Commissioner Oakley? Oh, so Commissioner Turk, hold on one sec, I'm afraid. I got two hands up here, so I'm sorry. Um, Sally wanted to go ahead and ask Commissioner Mariano that I'll be able to get to you. Give me one second. You see, wait, okay, I'll go to Commissioner Mariano, then Commissioner Starkey, and then we'll go I was going to say, I agree with Commissioner Oakley as far as that is causing a problem. Uh, up and down 19, small lots, trying to retrofit something. I think it's really hurt redevelopment up along 19. Um, I, you know, I, I think if we try to work with them more, like maybe we take those, you know, tree mitigation funds money we have and, and, and give them an incentive to go do it, not make them change the park and not make, make them do everything but help them improve the property, I think it would be a much better approach to go. So maybe we could tweak it. We, we, we want to make everything look good, 100% for it, but do we want to cause a burden to really affect that business? Should it really be tied to a roof? I'd say no. Commissioner Starkey. Um, you know, I like Commissioner Mariano's idea of maybe helping them more, um, but we don't, you know, we don't know the facts here. I want to make sure, first of all, that um, they know that right off the bat, there's $10,000 that we can help them with their landscaping, Commissioner Oakley. Um, but, but let's look and see if um, there's some way that we can even offer more because we don't want it to be a disincentive and not let these businesses expand. But we also don't want to keep um, them in the, the, the style that we had back in the 70s and prior to that where you could Put, put your building, pave the whole parking lot, and put in no landscaping. That that doesn't help the county either. Yeah. So I, th I think we should find a way that we can help these guys. Yeah, this, thank you for that. But it's, it's not the fact of not doing any. It's the fact that it seems to be an overabundance of landscape where you got such a small plot, there's basically almost no room for it. So, and I think Ms. Sherman is working with this group that I'm talking about now and she's you're going to be sitting back down with them i think aren't you uh, Ms. sherman unfortunately commissioner i was just i just received an email that they canceled the meeting that we had set up because i'm sure if given if given the opportunity we would have been able to assist them in some way but unfortunately they removed themselves from the process 
okay, um, all right, I'll reach out to them and uh, suggest that we have that meeting. They're, maybe they're thinking that it's, it's not going to change anything from the first pre-app meeting they had. And so I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to them and then give you a call about it. So I'll okay. forward their email to you. Okay. Mr. Biles? Thank you. Yes, sir. The other, as we were talking about the, you know, the landscaping reimbursement out of the tree fund, you know, it's capped at $10,000. We could look at increasing the cap. I, I think that cap's been there for a while. So inflation happens to landscaping like everything else. That's one thing we could go back and look True. at. And I think there is in excess of a million dollars in that fund. And so we could look at maybe bumping that cap up to cover some, uh, some more of these costs, if you yeah. will. So we'll, we'll take that back and we'll go look at that. You know, when you take in consideration a mom and pop restaurant, if, if that landscaping was going to cost them forty or fifty thousand dollars, they're forever trying to earn that money just to stay open, and so many of them are having a hard time now. So we probably need to look at look at that. But I will reach out to them and talk to them some more uh, because they probably have felt like it would not to expand or not to have this area out. They have no place for people to wait. It's a small business. They have no place for people if the restaurants got full capacity then they can't there's no place to wait so that's part of why they were going to do this like a porch or something out in front of it so people have a place to sit down and wait to have breakfast so or, or lunch whatever it might be but i'll reach back out to them they're in dade city so Commissioner, okay. Commissioner wells had a comment thank you chairman um commissioner oakley i can think of two um projects in my district alone over the last two years we made exceptions and matched um, with the tree mitigation fund that was over 10,000. The board was okay with it. It makes sense. You know, and I know I can remember Commissioner Mariano bringing this up in the past about what triggers it as far as the 50% rule. I, I disagree with that. I think if you're not adding to the, to the square footage, you know, it shouldn't necessarily trigger it. And that's one of the reasons we, we match these folks with the funding. Um, I know we've got the, the fund. I, I, I like the idea of maybe, maybe adding to it or, uh, you know, we probably need to look at that, but but I agree with you. It's it's tough for these businesses, and um, not only now, but over the last several years. And we need to do everything we can to help them expand, move, you know, hire more people, and so forth. So, and I'm familiar with what you're talking about. I was actually out there yesterday. So, yeah. um, and we did have to wait. And it would be nice for them to have something that's a great local business that been there for a long time. And uh, you know, so we definitely need to support them. So, yeah. Yeah. Mariana had a follow up. Seems like it's some these businesses right now, some of them are closing down. They just can't make it. So it's, it's a shame. So. Commissioner Mariano. Uh, yeah. no, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up, Commissioner Oakley. And, and I like the idea, Mr. Miles, about increasing the number. I think it's great as we're talking this through. I think one thing we should take a look at, just as you mentioned, Commissioner Oakley, about they're not making it. Right now, I think we're set up as a re reimbursement fund. It might be something where we can set it up where have it have the work done, prove it's been done, and get a check, and maybe they can work out a, a terms with their person who's doing the work for them to be able to have get reimbursed thereafter, rather, rather than having the business have to pay the money up front and then get the money back. A lot of them probably can't float that. So if we can work that situation where we're going to allot the money once the work's been done, and they, they can then pay their people after they get reimbursed from the county. Uh -huh. And I think most of your landscaping companies will probably be, be comfortable to work that way. So we just got to okay. be flexible. So I, we have time today. <laughs> so I think this might be a good time, Mr. Biles or, or Mr. Chairman, one of you um, explain, just in case the public is watching, um, how, what's the criteria for this tree medication fund to apply? And if we have, and I guess the other question would be, if we have approximately a million dollars in that account now, how much was spent last year? And when was the last time somebody actually applied for funding? I think you did. We, we y'all approved a reimbursement not too long ago. I don't remember what meeting it was on, um, but it was one not long, too long ago. But I, I don't know off the top of my head the process they go through to get it approved. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think some yeah. of these questions, though, we're going to have to go do research and bring back to you answers. I think that'd be it sounds good. like it makes yeah. sense to look at increasing the cap. Sounds like there's a, we need to think about how do we make streamline the process to get to approval quicker uh, and some other things. So, yeah, okay. 
Okay. Yeah, bring that back to the next meeting. That'd be great. Yeah, if we could have those questions answered, then you know we can if we can have maybe a discussion on criteria. It might be good to have just a, a quick little rundown, again, for the public's you know, best interest. Yeah. All right. Anything else, sir? Um, one other thing, um, and I had heard that there was some new fees, and I think uh, Mr. Cabala and I talked about it a little bit. There was a new fee that affected um, electric companies based on uh, changing out poles and right-of-ways, and it was like, I think, like $300 a pole. Um, from my understanding, it never had been charged before, but then that, all of a sudden it shows up. And any fee that is charged to any company in our, uh, in our county, I think, because because I don't know that we had an open discussion about it at the board with, with all our members. I don't know how this came about, but um, I think anything we're going to charge that charges a business or a citizen in this county that this board ought to be looking at it and, um, you know, really researching it and be sure it's the right thing for our county, not just a fee show up one day and we're not really aware of it. So. Mike, you want to answer something to that that effect? Uh, yes, sir. So the fee that is being referred to is is a right of way inspection fee. Uh, yes, that was not normally charged um, um, to a lot of a lot of places. In fact, as part of our uh, re revamping some of our departments and trying uh -huh. to get them to be more self sufficient, we we resorted to, you know, along with development services, we came up with a new fee structure. And that is just to reimburse our costs for doing right-of-way um, inspections. And so what we have done, however, is because there are a number of issues right now with, with communications uh, providers as well, we've, we've gone and suspended those fees in the interim while we take a look at how do we perhaps better streamline the right-of-way use uh, process for for utility providers such as electric and gas. So that is something that, that we are working on. That fee has been suspended um, and, and we will certainly partner with them and work with them along the way as we come up with a better process. Do we do process. any inspection or anything for these fees? I mean, so I, I charged. So I have not seen the report. I have asked to see how we arrived at the $300 fee and what those actual inspections entail. I don't have an answer for you, but it is a question that I have asked. But this one is uh, it's come about because of the change of, um, I guess, engineering. It used to be under a uh, building department. Now is under the utility department. Is that it? Or? Well, no. This is this is engineering services, engineering and services. and their their inspections group. And so, we we were looking to better align our costs with with those who receive the benefit of of those costs. And that was that was what was developed and, and came up with. Again, I don't have the the exact numbers, how many hours or full-time equivalents it takes to go out and perform one of those inspections and under what circumstances those inspections are, but those are things that we are looking into. In fact, we're looking at revamping the process instead of making perhaps individual permit applications, perhaps we can move to an annual type system, something that would streamline it and make it make it easier for those providers. All right. Well, the issue is, I mean, um, the different electric <coughs> companies, I'm sure they're out if they're doing their job, they're out replacing poles a lot in certain areas, making their their poles and all ready for the bad weather and everything that might be coming in the future. So, yeah. if they let it go and it gets terrible, they don't get refunded by FEMA or anybody else if if they don't keep those up to uh, the regular standards what they need to be for the storms and all. So, uh, but is that that new fees? that were not charged in engineering services prior to them coming over to utilities? It is my understanding that a fee was not charged uh, previously. Yeah. Correct. There was no fee charge. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but shouldn't the, shouldn't that come before this board that we discuss it, it, yeah. and decide? Well, yeah. Could I jump in real quick? So um, the question is, and you know, Commissioner Oakley just uh, brought it up too, so what is the, you know, how much time is an FTE obviously spending on this process? Are they actually, and I know the answer is no, but I mean, as in, they're not going out inspecting the actual pole after it's installed, from my, correct? They are not expecting the technical work. They are right. looking at the right-of-way to ensure that the right-of-way still meets our standards and is safe. Okay. 
So does that mean they're, they are driving out to the site to look at that right away for every, oh, I, I'm going to use the word pole, <laughs> um, structure, how about we use structure that is placed by utility company. When we say utility company, you're talking, you're, you're saying electric, you know, let's say power companies, as well as cable, um, Fios for a telephone company, whatever it may be, utilities in general, and the, the big bag. Right. I want to I want to confirm that. Okay. And, and what exactly okay. uh, has gone into that three hundred dollar fee? And again, that that will go into this more comprehensive. There's a better way to do business, I think, with utility providers, which are in our right of way, and we all have to exist there. And so we want to make sure that we can balance keeping the public safe yeah. and being efficient, so that way they can provide their vital services right. as well. I think the last thing. Last comment I'll make to we don't want to be a deterrent, as Commissioner Oakley just stated, if they're coming in and making replacements. If we deter them from making replacements, that could not be might not be in the best interest of our of our citizens in the community if that were to obviously happen. So if it's a deterrent for somebody to go make a replacement down the road, it's a life safety issue, possibly, right? Something to think about, Commissioner Wells. Yeah, and, and Mike, I know we discussed this, and you know, I know the cable companies are exempt, which doesn't make sense because they're the ones using contractors, they're the ones ripping up our lines, they're the ones we're spending a lot of time out there with. And I know we do not ex we do not inspect the electric companies now. Uh, my issue is even as early as last week, we still charge. We're going to charge the fee until I called you, and then you took care of it. So I don't know if we need to make a motion today to make the fee disappear until you relook at it, but that's my issue. We're still not all on the same page with all staff. Like I said, literally as early as last week, I had to deal with us saying, oh, there's a fee, and then with the coochie called me, and then Tico called me on something a couple weeks ago. So I, I just, I know it came before us. Um, I take responsibility for that, but once again, kind of like earlier with the, trans the transportation thing, it was kind of jumbled in with some other things that Again, this should have, the stakeholders should have been involved with this. Um, they've been great partners, all of them. Um, they are great partners, and we want to include them going forward with whatever we think is best for, obviously, you know, to pay for our expense, whatever expense there is. So um, I, that's only my concern with you suspending it is, so I, I don't, it's up to the board, but I, I don't know if you all hear it. I know that I have, and I, as early as last week, so just want to throw that out there. If we suspend it, what's is it just going to automatically show up one day as a fee to somebody, and we not be able to discuss it or go forward, or should we have a have a motion that holds it suspended until we hear back from y'all on the answers, so we make sure it's the right thing to be doing. So it's on it's on your fee schedule today, you know, and we because of the communication services issue and the preemption where we can't charge them in other things. You know, we might suspend it. You know, obviously the board can do what the board desires. I, I will say that there are inspections that we do. If the if the company that requires the inspection isn't going to pay for that, then the ultimately it's the general fund that has to cover that cost. So and that's kind of what's happening today with the communication service companies is the general fund is covering the cost of us going out there to make sure that those companies aren't damaging our right of way, i.e. our pavement, our structures, our things. So you know we can continue with it suspended while we go through this process. I actually ultimately think we go to an annual permit process where there's an annual permit to include the permit, because they still pay the permit fee. They submit the right-of-way permit, they still pay the permit fee for that. But we go to an annual process so they don't have to come in every single time they do something. They just notice us. I think that already happens in Pinellas. I think Hillsborough already has something similar to that. I think that's probably where we need to be, but, but it's going to take us a little time to get there. Mr. Yes, go ahead, Commissioner Mariana. We'll suspend it until we uh, get, some, I guess, find out some history or something that will bring it back to us and we discuss it. Yeah, I've, I've already suspended it, but if the board would like to reaffirm that, I, it's your purview. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Go ahead. You know, one, one thing with any time a utility is 
being charged a fee. It's going to get passed on to the customer. Now, with Lacucci, probably doesn't mark it up, but I'm sure Duke does. Um, I think it's something you know to, to think anyone in the county is paying these fees, no matter what it is, it's just how they get, how it gets to them. So the, the more we can take it out, uh, the quicker the better. Um, you guys want to bring us back something? I'm okay to wait on it. Uh, we can say we're going to permanently end this anyway, and you can bring back something, another alternative to us. That's fine. Um, so I'm comfortable if someone makes, if we want to make a motion for that now, that's good, and we'll make them bring something back to us when they've got a resolution, whether it be the annual fee or whatever it may be. As part of those fees, I'm talking about one thing about changing polls, but it, are there other fees that haven't been charged that's going to be also in that group? So to be any inspection that's required of those groups within the right of way. So if they're changing out the poles, if they're setting a new service or whatever work that they might do, that's where that, that inspection fee. And that's why I want to go ahead and do a comprehensive review of what probably needs to be inspected more frequently than others. And again, you know, looking at well, an annual to, subscription. Yeah, just to assure that it comes back before us when you're ready, when you've done that research and bring it back, I'd like to make a motion that we suspend it until that time and then uh, we'll look at it and it be noticed so so everybody's on board to understand what the fees are for and their um, I mean if it's a new fee then we, we really need to know that too so uh, so I, I'd make that motion now second I have a motion in a second any more discussion uh, Mr. Biles well my concern is that you know it's not just our utility companies that get right away permits and pay an inspection fee Developers do that. I mean, the other people get right away permits, and the inspection fee I think applies there as well. So, can we s at least separate out that this is really for the maintenance of existing facilities and not necessarily for the in those types of permits versus new construction and new development? Mm -hmm. At least then we don't have, you know, we, we do have, you know, the board kind of has a policy that development needs to pay for development. Yeah. You know, which. Mm -hmm. Again, well, I understand that. Those. I'm not talking about a new development coming in and you have fees you charge. I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the ones that are going to affect, uh, I guess, the, when a utility goes out, utility goes out and puts in a new line, and that's changed out 25 or 30 poles at one time. You know that type of thing. So that's not a new development. It's, it's keeping their lines up to the standards. So that's what I'm talking about. We don't. Okay. Is that okay? Good. Okay. So I have a motion and a second on that. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Sorry, it was a motion by Commissioner Oakley and a second by Commissioner Mariano. Thank you. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye. Motion passes 5 0. The only thing left I have is uh, the discussion on the mask was very good. Uh, I told you earlier that uh, from my emails I've gotten from the citizens, probably 80, 85% of them were very positive and wanting us to keep that mask order in, in place until um, at this time. But, uh, and we had a little uptick in those numbers. So I want to, make sure you know that's that's a good thing to keep in place at this time and we look at it next month and and see what it is but no sense in taking that away too early and i are definitely we're um we are here to keep our public as safe as possible and we've done a thanks for mr biles and his staff and everyone involved uh pasco county has been very safe during this whole time so we've done a great job so that's all Thank you, sir. Do you want to Commissioner Wells? Commissioner Starkey? Or? Oh, no. To, oh, hey, sorry. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, all I did was look to my left. <laughs> sorry. Go ahead, hey, Commissioner Starkey. Um, yeah, um, really just one thing. Um, and hey, and great discussion on the dredging. And frankly, great discussion on the landscaping as we can help our citizens uh, more. Um, that's a win-win for all of us. And I was kind of surprised to hear how much money we have in that mitigation, that tree mitigation trust fund. So let's get it back out on the street and uh, raise, you know, help it, helping our businesses look better. Um, 
I wanted to bring up a subject that's been, you know, kind of a sore subject for me in the past, and that is, again, our outside lobbyists. And I did talk to uh, the uh, administrator about it, but frankly, I think um, we're shooting ourselves in the foot by not having um, having our outside lobbyists. I've talked to commissioners in other counties, and um, we might we might be the only county this size that. I think it would be the only county this size that, that doesn't have at least one outside lobbyist. The other ones have multiple firms. So I want to say, um, especially at a time when money is going to be even tighter in Tallahassee, that we need to be looking out for the best interests of our citizens. Um, and having someone on retainer for, say, $40,000 or so is going to bring back dividends to the county. Um, you saw what happened to us in this last year, and I've looked at what other counties got to keep, and I think we can do a little better, and um, I think Ralph does a great job, uh, but there is a difference between an internal lobbyist and an external lobbyist, and we are better served if we have both. Okay. Commissioner Mariano. Yeah, I will, I will concur with that. Um, you know, when I look at how much money we had out there that was going to be set, and, and this current year with uh, Speaker Sprouls and President Simpson, we are in position to do something. But when we don't have our lobbyist who's tied in with these guys, uh, and Sean Foster, I think, at Sunrise was our last one. I think we should bring him back on. What the job they could do for us, if he only gets one thing for us, we're way out of the game. It, you've, got to, you've got to be up there. You've got to be in their face. You've got to be pushing to get these things through. So. Uh, Commissioner Starkey, thank you for bringing it up. I think you're right on the money. Commissioner Wells. Yes, I, I also agree with Commissioner Starkey. Um, and again, Ralph does an unbelievable job. Again, we're lucky to have him up there. But I know, for instance, you know, the school board has their internal person and an external person. They work together as great as a team. And in the past, Sean's worked great with us as a team. So I, I agree with you both on that. So I'm glad you brought it up, Commissioner. Thank you. Do we know how many people um, well, Hillsborough has, Commissioner Starkey, now? Do you know? They have, um, I, I know they have um, Washington and local firms. I don't know how many they have local, but it's more than one. And I will tell you that both Hillsborough and Pinellas, um, and Pinellas had the one that we let go, Van Scoik, up in Washington. They both got bill grants this year. I don't know if you saw that, but they got tens of millions of dollars uh, from from Washington this year. So, uh, but anyway, I, I would like to put it in motion form that we uh, bring back our lobbyists and um, see if there's a second. Second with discussion, Chairman. Go ahead, Commissioner Welch. Um, Commissioner Starkey, I agree with you on both aspects. I think, especially with looking at this dredging that Commissioner Mariano has yeah. been working on for the last couple of years. Does um, your motion include doing a federal lobbyist as well as state? I would love that if there was support. We are really missing out. And uh, now we really have a, another project. You know, we never would have got our Rich Road, road permit without our help, without that help. And I, I agree that we should have a federal lobbyist help us with this whole coastal um, effort. Absolutely. Yep. Well, I, I mean, if that's... So, can, I, can, I, can I jump in real quick, too? Um, let's talk about the federal one though real quick on the federal side I mean so I'm, I'm gonna ask on the federal side what was our will we say our return on investment with the federal lobbyists we previously had how how many bills were passed on our behalf how much funding did we receive from the group we had previously hired on as federal lobbyists can anybody answer that I, mean, I know the answer but you I'm know, just asking we, we, <laughs> We have to be smart about what we ask for, um, and we haven't used our lobbyists right because uh, we haven't put had a project besides our Ridge Road one that we went up there and asked them for. Although I did ask for help in changing some of the uh, labor laws, and we did get that. So, um, so uh, um, that that not not necessarily is a straight county county project, but. Even Martin County, the little Martin County over on the other side, they have two lobbying firms in, in uh, Washington. They bring back millions and millions of dollars. So we, we have to be more savvy 
about um, what we're asking for. Um, I think that um, the transportation money, I think there's this um, possibly this dredge money. I think I think uh, we should look at what other counties have done and, and mimic that and, and not always pay things for ourselves. I know that I, I told the administrator, I ran into Secretary Anod um, somewhere in Tallahassee last year, and you guys remember him, he was the head of DOT, yes. uh, Florida DOT, yes. Secretary Anod. Yes. He told me he was shocked that we were paying for the overpass extension all by ourselves, and that that was a definitely a project that could have got some money in Washington if we had asked so for all it. That, so why so, didn't we, so when, yeah, I mean, so this is just my question on the federal side. So we had th those folks for two years, if it wasn't correct, and there were certain things that we had discussed about Tiger Grants and, and whatever it may be in addition to, and we piled on top of that. Well, we didn't get anything. So I'm not saying a federal lobbyist itself is not a good idea, um, but we did not get any return on our investment with the group that we had. And well, I'm not knocking them. So I mean, do, you, do we, so, so do we need to, for on, on the federal side, if you're saying, okay, do we move forward again with a federal lobbyist? I'm not saying we, we do or don't, but I'm saying is, do we go look at who else is out there in addition to who we have previously well, I, had? So, so here's the deal, like the, the bill grant that Pinellas just got, it took a number of years of lobbying, and you know, we can, you can ask any one of the, uh, you know, we're all friends with the commissioners. I can tell you Janet Long went up to Washington three to four times um, was was uh, and went around with her her lobbyists and some people from the business community. They worked that grant, um, and it took them a, a, quite a few years to get it. And I wouldn't doubt that Hillsborough County would tell us the same thing. So, um, so we we have to have a plan. We have to have an ask, and then we have to go work it. And you can't expect it in a year or two, but you have to build those relationships. And I think that's what. Uh, those kind of guys, those guys can do for you and gals. Okay, Commissioner Mariano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And you know, when you when you look at Van Swick, I think they're a great company. Um, I think it does take time. It, you you just can't get it in a year or two. It's going to take, you know, even even a regular road project takes five years through our own MPO process. So it, it takes time to get it for that. But if you look at federal lobbyists, Dawson's a federal lobbyist. They stuck with us on Ridge Road. Right. When we signed up with them, it was a time, don't expect it right away, it's gonna take time. And there were times we made decisions year after year. Are we gonna keep doing this or are we gonna keep doing this? Right. And because we persevered and stuck with it, we got it through. Right. So you know, it, it does take time to go through it. So you know, don't go just by what we did for the short term and dropped it, because you know, it, it's tough. I will tell you. But I don't want, I'm, but I'm not trying to interrupt, I'm gonna continue on the conversation, mm -hmm. but I guess I'm just asking these questions out loud because I wanna mm -hmm. know what was brought to them what suggestions were made to them by our team and, and staff of what to go f after mm -hmm. and what happened to it? Because I just didn't see any. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll say this, you know, in, in, you know, Commissioner Wells, I'm, I'm so glad you just brought up the federal side, especially mentioned dredging as well, because right now we're gonna be going through the biggest dredging project we ever had in the county. So we're gonna be looking doing all this thing, and I'm telling you that pot two money with Restore is just untouched from us and it takes big projects to get it done. It's got to be tied to water quality and economic development. We're right in the mix of that whole thing. I think we could look at them, but we can also look at others, and, and let's go look at who's going to be help us best with transportation, best, best with the restoration, I'll call it, up and down the coast. But I think there's an opportunity that's out there that could be absolutely huge for money that we should go take a look at. We're, we're, too, we're too big, we're too premier accounting not to go after that. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Oakley. I'm not sure that I ever heard us even ask for anything for overpass road when they were, did we ask Mr. Yes, Miles, sir. You yeah, know? I think we submitted at least one Tiger application. We didn't submit a build grant application this time because we did not have any projects ready in the window Right for that. So well, we gave that to the federal lobbyists? Yeah. Over, well, and our overpass? federal lobbyist contract ran out at the end of last year. I'm not sure if it was the fiscal year or the calendar year, but ran out right. last year. So I just don't know, we, remember us talking about uh, asking about overpass or for funds for overpass. But yeah. I definitely know we were pushing very hard. 
and, and I will say that so. our engineering services team does a very good job getting money out of the state. I think right now we have about 85 million, I think is the number I saw, money out of the state going towards current Pasco <coughs> County projects. So, I mean, they're working it pretty hard. So through, through the process, through the FDOT process. So, um, so there is that out there. I will say that if, you know, if the board, neither, there's not funding for either one in the budget that's on the agenda for approval this afternoon. If the board wants to do that, then we will obviously amend the budget at the next available meeting when we can to add funding into the budget to do that. And then we will go through the solicitation process for both contracts. Well, that was my next question. Where are we going to get the money from? I, I don't know. I, this, <laughs> uh, this, uh, this discussion is new to me. So oh, yeah. we will have to get back with OMB to see where the money's coming from. But I agree. Commissioner Mayotta. Yeah, I mean, we, we've done a great job putting our reserves back in as well. If I got to go pull from reserves to go make this happen, I think it's well worth doing. Well, I think, well, I don't think we need to do that. I think we do have, there was there were some funds that we were returned mm -hmm. and we have not made any, uh, there was a small ask on it, but I know there are some left over. Now that would be reoccurring. That would be obviously cover you for the year. I'm just saying we can get this done. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I don't, if you want to, you don't have to dip in reserves. What I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> so what I'm, what I'm hearing, the direction the board would like us to, to amend the budget, to fund both the state and federal lobbyist, and we will go through the solicitation process for both and bring those contracts back to the board when we're ready to. So I don't, I don't know if that was Commissioner Starkey's motion. Um, yeah. Like, Yes, okay. and I would say the local, you know, is as soon as possible because committee meetings are going to be starting soon. Commissioner Mariana. They start in December, so especially the local one, we need to get that done by December one way or the other. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking to the right, but there's nobody there anymore. <laughs> so, Chairman, just so I can make clear, I'm Commissioner Starkey, so you're okay with us putting it out to bid and then taking the most qualified you don't want to use? Who we, who we had picked in the past to do the local state stuff? Mr. Chairman, you can't just go with Mr. Foster. Okay. It has to go out. Okay. Bid. Sounds good to me. I seconded it, so. Okay, but I, um, um, I would not like this to get in purchasing or whatever and be stuck there for six months. This is time is of the essence because it doesn't do us any good to bring one on six months after they've already started. <laughs> so. Um, how since we've done this in the past, you already have a con you know you already have the language to get a bit out on the street. Can we just polish off the one we had before and get it out on the street this week? Commissioner, I don't know. I, I, mean, I didn't know this item was going to come up for discussion today. Otherwise, I'd have done a little research. So um, uh, once the meeting ends, I'll get with purchasing and our team to see what we can do. Commissioner Mariano. All right. If you could please take a look at both contracts, the last contracts we had, and if we can find a way to extend them. They're expired, Commissioner. Both expired? Okay. okay I, would, I would assume because that way you don't have to go through the process and right. wait on it. Yeah, wait for six months. They're, they're long behind, beyond being able to resuscitate. Okay. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, I think we have to call the vote. Is that a vote or? Yeah, you have a motion. You have a motion by Commissioner Starkey. I have a second by Commissioner Wells. Uh, oh, I was going to yeah. wait for, we had one step out for a moment, but I think we'll be okay. Can you, can you give me one second? I'm going to see if he's coming down the hall. If you don't yeah. mind, we'll give us one sec to check. I'm trying to think if I have anything else. Well, he's on his way back and I'll call it. Give me one second, Commissioner. I would want to remind everybody about the two, the two, two souls. Um, bring let's let's keep collecting shoes and socks for our students. Okay. It's a great uh, project that that we have going on. So we need shoes, we need socks. Okay, great. So I can call that vote. Now I have a motion by Commissioner Starkey, a second by Commissioner Wells. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. District 1, Commissioner Oakley. Aye. District 3, Commissioner Starkey. Aye. District 4, Commissioner Wells. Aye. District 5, Commissioner Mariano. Aye. District 2, Chairman Moore. Aye, motion passes by zero. Okay. Are we, are we good, you good, Commissioner? 
Yes, thank you very much. All right, thank you, ma'am. All right, now I will go to Commissioner Wells. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just have one thing, um, Sally, if you don't mind, um, and Jack has part of this, this community in his district, and I have part of it in my district. It's Golden Acres community. You probably don't know where that is yet. You might. Um, it's just right, literally, right next door, down Little Road. So it's weird. It's an agriculture community. Half of the community is zoned AR. Half the community is zoned ER. The issue that we're having with code is in ER and AR, you're allowed the same agriculture uses, horses, chickens, all those things. But in ER, you're not allowed like electric fence, for instance, to keep your livestock in cows, which you need to keep them in. Uh, you're, they're, you're constricted by heights on fences. And it's just very confusing. I don't understand why you know, everything is an acre or more out there. I don't understand why half's AR, why half's ER, but I really would like to see us look at making, I guess, first of all, find out maybe why it was split, and then if we could look at changing it all to AR, because I, I don't know why it would be a state um, residential in some of Golden Acres. It, it's weird. So I, I, the only reason it came up is because code had to, got called on somebody, went out there, and I'm like, hang on. They're allowed to have these cows or these horses, but they're not allowed to have this fence because it's ER, but the guy across the street's AR. So I just, I, I don't understand why. So if you don't, if you don't mind, and maybe bring it back, please, if you could. So thank you very much. Is that it? That's it. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. Tough to draw that line. Commissioner Mariano. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, want to say that uh, had a great uh, cleanup for us for the, the coast. Uh, Hudson, I was, that's where I was at in the morning, uh, did a great job. A lot of citizens got involved. Everyone had masks on, protection on. Uh, very, very pleased the way it went. Uh, I did mention the board, we did have a meeting with Nye Florida about what's going on and to assure the people in Hudson. Uh, one of the things was talked about is septic systems, did everybody get hooked up? I think other than four or five in the whole area, everybody was hooked up. Uh, so I don't think that's causing a, a problem out there. We're going to keep on working with DEP to get to deeper things, but the new pipes that are in that area are, you know, in good shape. So, wasn't some of the thoughts we thought, but we did investigate it. Um, I want to say, uh, Mr. Carbella, I, I want to praise you guys again for getting agenda item C60 on the line uh, on for us today. It's the street sweeping. Part of our basin management plan is to actually do that, especially on the coast. So that's going to help us talk to DEP a little bit stronger about here's what we're doing to to do what we're supposed to do. And Mike, I want to thank you again uh, for your team. Uh, they did a great job out Scallop Drive. They're getting that pipe in place so that gets replaced. Uh, that's collapsed all around it, so it's going to help out dramatically. And the, the second set of pipes and working on Tower Drive as well. Uh, people are very, very happy. So you got a tremendous team out there that really has got great talent. So we got to make sure we keep them happy every step of the way because they're doing doing a great job. And that's all I got. That's it. Uh, Mr. Biles. Well, actually, one more thing. Yes. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. I, I touched it on it earlier. Um, I was with, um, stopped by a, a place called Point Distillery the other day uh, to, to visit with him, and he said he wanted to talk to me, so I, I went in and had the talk with him. And when COVID hit, uh, we were all looking for people to, to kind of go out, and a lot of breweries brilliantly strapped up, and they started making the... Uh, the hand sanitizer. And these guys were no different. And the vats that they have are like phenomenal. So they went out there and they invested heavily. They went out and bought thousands and thousands. They ended up giving many, much of it away, sold the rest of it at cost. Uh, currently, this sitting on uh, 20, I believe it's 1,000 cases of material taken up about a third. Think of this, a third of the storage space. All big cardboard boxes loaded up. They says, Jack, we made this stuff. We made it with the best ingredients possible. It's 80%, which is great for sanitizer. It's not like 60% that doesn't work for you. It's 80%. It's the best material. He says, I really would like to see if there's any way we can try to find a way to sell this, promote this, and get it out there. I says, well, as far as I know, we're working on so many things with CARE, spending money on trying to protect our community. Uh, everybody, I believe, agrees keeping your hands clean is the number one thing. If we're going to keep on, especially with this ordinance, a little bit further, uh, I think we should reach out to these folks that have done so much for the community, put themselves at risk, and again, a small business in a sense uh, that's really been hampered by the, doing the good work they did to protect our citizens. 
I think we should go look at the CARES money. And I know, Mr. Biles, we talked about it just briefly, but I got word that maybe we were only going to buy 15 to 20 cases from them. So I want to have the discussion about buying all that they've got and finding a way to get it to the community to protect our people out there. So if you would, let's talk us. Do we, from my understanding before, that we had a pretty good stockpile, I thought. Did we not? Already? Doesn't FOSTA have a pretty good? This information was sent to emergency management, and they were working on what they needed, and we're going to work with the with Point Distiller about what they need to buy and then try to work through the I purchasing Unless process. I talked, I thought we had a lot. That's because I was yeah. trying to get it out to some businesses, too. So. Yeah, we have a, I think we have a decent amount of supply. That doesn't mean we don't need more. I don't know if we need well, 20,000 cases. I wonder what so we I, had. I asked Andy, my expert on that, in our supplies, our PPE, to get with the Point Distillery and work through our purchasing process to figure out what we needed and buy what we needed to buy to have it in our supplies. I just want to make, and I appreciate it, I just want to make sure we're not buying what we don't need or spending dollars on a product that we don't have a need for. If we need it, we need it. If we don't, we don't. That's why I got emergency management involved, because they're the ones that know how much we need, ha have and need right, right. now. Okay. Mr. Chairman? Yeah, go ahead, please. Part of, and, and again, I'm ha I, was, I went through that process, and only just a few minutes before did I get the word that we're going to buy 15 to 20 cases, mm -hmm. all right? Which, if you look at every single school, you look at every single business that's for trying to protect everybody around here, I've got a company that actually spent their money put this thing out there to go protect people, and now they're stuck with a stockpile. At the same time, we're saying this COVID is so severe, we're going to keep this mask mandate still in place for another couple of weeks as we look it forward. Every single school, if you could probably put enough in there, you could probably fill every school up with one for every classroom. It still might not even be enough. You could take every restaurant that's already struggling and suffering that has to try to protect their employees and their people that are out there that put them in there. We can go buy it all, and we can go give it away to our citizens our businesses that are here, our schools we'll do, we'll that are that here. Now. And that's why I say, so let's, I don't want to wait, I didn't want to wait two weeks to come back in this conversation. Yeah, we do I want to go, have us to go find a way to go buy all of it and then let's go find a way to get it out there. And I think schools alone, I had someone reach out to me when, they, when I floated this out on Facebook. Uh, they says, well, don't forget the schools. Right. Businesses says, well, don't forget us. So between both of them, I'm going to tell you, it's only $70,000 when we get all these millions of dollars are out there, I think we should go do it, do it now, get the word out there, and let people go start protecting themselves, especially in the situation we're in right now. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Wells. No, it was. Oh, I'm sorry. He <laughs> <laughs> was your lawyer. It was your lawyer who had to respond to that last yeah, comment. Yeah. So there are lots of, well, I understand what the commissioner is raising with the Point Distillery, there are lots of distilleries that find themselves in the same position. And you are still constrained by the laws of the state of Florida on competitive bidding. This is not something you can say is not available. I mean, when, when nothing was available, we could waive procurement to get there. But now that there are others that are available, I'm not so sure that you can just say, we're going, to buy, we're going to buy this particular vendor out of the problem that they're in. You may be able to, but I don't know that it's as cut and dry as just buying all his inventory, because there are others that are in the same position. Well, and again, let's go look at it. Um, again, for them to say they're going to be, now, if you're going to tell me you, you can buy 15 to 20, but you can't buy 70. What's the difference? I mean, if you can do it one, one step, you can do it the next step. All I want them to do is to go find out. And if there are other, if there are, if we have other people in Pasco County that went and, and built this stuff and built a good product as well that's out there, and they're sitting on it as well, and I've got to have my own people go out and buy it, and I've got CARES money that's supposed to go help me to go protect my community, then I would like staff to go out, find a way, if, you, if there's a way possible, at least make the attempt to go find a way to get it out there find out what's out there, and get it to whether it be schools or businesses, but get it out there in the community so people can protect themselves more. Mr. Bob. So uh, we are, I mean, we are providing PPE to people who ask. Uh, I will say that um, it appears that the state is supplying the schools with the PPE that they need with, and, and to include hand sanitizer and those kinds of things. And so the other thing we can do is have REM send the contact information up to the state, and so maybe they can do a direct procurement as well. So that may be another way to solve that. Um, so 
we, we know what we need. We will we'll continue to buy to keep our stock supply going through the process as the county attorney outlined. Uh, and, and so that's, that's kind of what our plan is. And I don't know what that final number is, and we are always going to be continuing to buy them as we need it, but you don't want to build up too much of a stockpile either. Let me ask you this. Is this considered PPE? I don't know if we included hand sanitizer in the list of things we were reimbursed. I think we did, but I don't know off the top of my head. If it's considered PPE and if someone comes to you and asks for you for it, you're going to give that to them? So the small businesses, we had a PPE grant process where they were submitting applications and that is still available where they can submit an application and we can reimburse them for what they have bought. That, that's still available. Do you remember the theory of that? what that was? The what? The theory of why we did it that way? Let me tell you what, let me tell you what Mr. Cronin told me. The reason we're going to go do it that way instead of people just going out and uh, going a different way, just applying and give it to them, because we wanted the businesses to be able to make money as they were going to go get it. So what I'm telling you is we've got a situation where a business that actually went out and got it, built it because we needed it, we said we needed it, is now stuck with it. So for the same theory that we're trying to help a businesses out by making people go out and buy that so it helps the economy, I'm telling you, we had a local business right here that went out and did the right thing to try to protect people, and they got $70,000 70, worth of product that's out there that they can use it. And I will tell you, I will load my truck up, up and down and go up and down every single road, every single restaurant, and I guarantee you, if I offer it to the people that are out there protecting people with hand sanitizer, they'll take it and they'll use it. I'll even be do the distribution. That's how many people I think will want this thing. Maybe it's disagreeing. I think it just we want to find out how much we have now. I don't know the total our, number of what we have in I think our that's stock. What we need to find out. I, I know yeah. what Andy has said he's needed and he's reached out and he's trying to procure that amount from him. It's not the whole thing. It's not hundred percent. So if you, let us work through the procurement process, let's work through the planning process and do it the right way. Let me let me ask this question. You you said that if people ask you for PPE you should you provide it to them. So if you get enough calls to say, I want hand sanitizer, that would change the amount that you would actually need? Yeah, again, okay. emergency so manager is the one with that, and he is, they are, that is part of the PPE program, is hand All sanitizer. I, and I, so will, I will help the, you with that. The businesses that. have a process to get reimbursed. Okay. Anything else? Commissioner Mariano. No, sir. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Commissioner, or Commissioner. Mr. Biles. All right, a uh, couple of items uh, on the good news front. Um, both Fitch and Moody's uh, redid a credit evaluation on the county as part of our new bond offering that's going out shortly. Um, and both of them held us constant with what we were last time, so double A2 and then double A um, on S or on Moody or Fitch was double A. And Fitch's rating included a stable outlook which puts the county in a very low credit risk category. Now, keep in mind, we're right in the middle of a pandemic where local governments and state governments across this country are had significant financial distress, and that is the rating that you got as a board got from the two largest rating agencies in the country with respect to our new. So that says that as a board, in the, in the process we are using to budget and expense our money is, is well received in New York and the way we manage our, our, our budget process and everything else. So I just wanted to give you that bit of good news that came out over the weekend. The other one is, if you didn't see it on Friday, our unemployment rate in Pasco County is down to 6.7%, um, which is, I'm not sure I was expecting to see that number until after the turn of the calendar. Uh, and not only that, when you actually dig into the numbers, 10,000 more people are working in August than we're working in July. And that's a pretty substantial number. Still a little less than where we were last August, but um, getting, there. getting there and getting there pretty fast. So that's, that's, that's good uh, for Pasco County. That's consistent across the Tampa Bay region, it, it, those kinds of numbers. So that's, that's positive and that's positive leading into, as we talk about budget tonight, that puts us in a pretty stable and secure position. So that's all I had. Those two pieces of good news. Okay, thank you. Here's Snyder. 
I don't have anything um, that I need to talk to you about today. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. I do, I have some things. First, I um, passed out some goodies. Uh -huh. So, your CAFR, mm -hmm. Comprehensive Annual Financial Report, and um, this is new common sense. Oh. Wanna see that, ching with sense. Um, this is the PAFR. Uh, we've called it the common sense because it is um, the way to understand everything that's in this big boy right here. Um, this, um, the CAFR provides many financial statements that are audited. You all know this, it's annually done. Um, we have won the award in excellence in financial reporting for 36 years. We're waiting to see if we're going to have it for the 37th year. They haven't posted out the award winners yet, but I wanted to let you know that. And this um, common sense is the um, user-friendly guide to explain. Book notes version. <laughs> and it's, it's much um, more colorful, um, but it explains really well the information that's contained within the CAFR itself. Um, so, I, oh, and did you notice um, there is a cover model this year on the CAFR? It's John Blummel. I don't know if you know who. Yeah. So um, one of our inside, locals is on the cover, cover, one of our farmers. Hmm? I think we were talking about the inside cover. Oh, no, no, no. no. You're in, you're in the, the one, too, okay. the other one. <laughs> you're in common sense as well. Okay, so I wanted to let you know that the CAFR um, or the audit, the annual audit, is starting November 2nd, so my team is getting ready. Your team is getting ready. It's a, a consolidated effort on that. Um, I also wanted to mention um, our Inspector General Office. We, um, um, are, we put out the questionnaire to your management team as well as um, my management team, and all of you received letters as well. We're looking to, for input and feedback, so that closed up, so I just wanted to say thank you to the county and to the management of the county for that. That's going to provide input on our annual audit plan. This is the first time we're doing that. And I wanted to make it more of a risk-based audit plan so that we're all informed about what is going to be on that plan. Um, so once we get that information back, um, the analysis will be done uh, based upon risk and we'll put together the audit plan and then actually file it here in the BCC meeting on a consent item so that everyone can see that. Um, we are in the Inspector General's office. We're on a journey to be peer reviewed. Uh, peer reviewed is the gold standard for credibility and reliability in internal auditing. It is international standards. So we're on our way there. It's about a three year process. We've used this first year um, as me being clerk to do our first year. So we have two years left and next year we'll have a mock review and that's when certified auditors come in and audit our auditors. So we'll have a hopefully a gold level of audits in the next uh, say two year time period. So I just wanted to say thank you for providing the feedback on those surveys for our Inspector General's office and just trying to raise the level of, um, of the products that we, we, we provide. And the last thing I wanted to mention, I mentioned it last time, but it's just a reminder, Monday we will have our in-service, so we'll have our office-wide trainings will be virtual, and that'll be September 28th all day, so our office will be closed to the public and to your offices for training. That's it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's see if I can talk for two hours. <laughs> just kidding. A few things. Uh, first one, uh, um, census response rate. We're in the final push for the census to get everyone counted that we can. Uh, we know as we have a population growth, we've seen it. Um, we want to continue to encourage everyone to fill out the census, whether you do it online or if somebody knocks on your door, please go ahead and um, fill that out. It's obviously very important for our future, to the future of Pasco County. Uh, it can mean a lot of things when it comes to funding. In addition to that, it can also, uh, also um, have positive implications when it comes to, you know, things like house seats that could be added to our area. So we're doing pretty good though. We have a great team that's doing an awesome, awesome job. Um, September, we surpassed our 2010 self response rate. So that's really strong when you think we're in the middle of a pandemic and the team's doing better than it, what we did in uh, September of, uh, uh, no, sorry, in 2010. I um, think we're at 66.2% self-response rate. Our final 2010 self-response rate was 65.5. So I'm sure we're gonna we're gonna make it there. So, so 
So thank you to all the citizens that have responded so far, but it is very, very important. It just takes a few minutes. I did it. I'm sure everybody here did it. I'm sure everybody I see in the audience has done theirs too, right? Everybody nods their head. Yes, we did the census. Good, good. Um, so, Commissioners, uh, this morning you saw on the consent agenda, we passed a resolution declaring September 25th as Disabled American Veterans Day here in Pasco County. Disabled American Veterans is a nonprofit organization. They're celebrating 100 years of service to those that have served our country. The organization is dedicated to empowering veterans to lead high quality lives with respect to dignity and they help veterans and their families navigate through the VA process. So we're happy that this resolution passed today and obviously we want to offer our continued support and celebrate all of our veterans. So, and I appreciate Mr. Steinsnyder, your office helped expedite getting this done on today's agenda um, when the request came in. So thank you and your team for that. We really appreciate it. It's important that we got that done this month. Um, one thing I do need um, consensus on from this board is our November BCC location. Um, originally, we had a meeting and da, 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 the first, no, first Tuesday of November. Um, we decided that needed to be canceled, that meeting as we did, what, I think two meetings ago, I think we did? Yes. Okay. Day after the election, which probably everybody in here will be up till the next day <laughs> or next morning. Um, so, we did change that, but um, as you know, when we have um, when we reorganize, that is always done in the county seat. Always has been done in the county seat. Um, but the November seventeenth meeting is scheduled for Newport Ritchie, so I'm asking that we can change that November seventeenth meeting to Dade City, so we can stay with obviously the tradition of the reorganization and any and then your re swearing ins. Um, be done in, in Dade City. Are we good with that? Yep. Okay. I definitely am. Commissioner Starkey. Yeah, well, I guess you yeah of course you are. You're not going to be there. That's right. <laughs> right. I thought it was going to be refreshing that we didn't have to do it in Dade City and we could um, be where the majority of the commissioners live over on the west side. So um, I'm game for keeping it right there on the west side. Well, again, we do have a little bit of a tradition, that being the county seat for the county. Um, I have, I have three tradition here that are. Takes over. I have, yeah. I, you, I'm sorry, you lost though. There's four of us here that want to do it. <laughs> all, all four, Jack. Come yeah. on. Oh, Catherine. <laughs> tradition, county seat. They're letting you down, and you're not here. Yeah, see, that, that, that'd be like the president. Yeah, that would be like the president of the United States being sworn in in, you know, I, I don't know, California. Yeah. Right. So, that, <laughs> oh, God. Uh, California. He's always. Well, it's always in that. It's always at. Yes, yeah, it's always in the the capital, which is Washington D.C. So, uh, are we good? We're good. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. But thank you, Commissioner Starkey, for <laughs> like jumping on board. Wait, wait, so but what, what we're going to do, hey, just so you know, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and change the other date city meeting in December to Newport Ritchie, just so you know. No, I should have mentioned that. They were even. Okay. Yeah, so you'll, you'll, you'll be added, you'll, we'll add a meeting on the docket for Newport Ritchie, so you're not losing out, right? Is that what okay. you said, Mr. Biles? Yes, sir. So what I'm hearing is November 17th in Dade City, wow. December 8th in Newport Ritchie. Yep. Uh, you know. So that's what we'll do, because Newport, December 8th was supposed to be in Dade City. We're going to go ahead and switch it over here to Newport Ritchie. Yeah, that's what we're doing. Yep, how about that? Even, even swap. Okay. So, okay, I, I suppose that's probably good for public hearings, because if we're canceling yes. the one and the east side, the west side, then we need to get them on the schedule. Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay. I always have a solution. <laughs> One thing I did want to bring up, and let me find it, and I apologize. It came up earlier. Da, da, da. Take your mask out. I got two hours still, so. Uh, um, I've had some requests in the past, and I had another one today for some help on Causeway Boulevard, which is in Atlanta Lakes. Um, I, it's it's really a private road, but it it's kind of strange. 
Don't say that. No, I, yeah, I know. Maybe not. I don't know. They just have these really bad pot. They have these really bad potholes. Um, if it is a, I don't get a lot of requests for these. In if that it's area. a, if it is a truly private road, you cannot do a one-time fix. If it is a non-main, the non-county maintained road. If it's a road that's that's dedicated to the public, but we don't maintain it, then you can do a one-time fix. All right. That's we, the that's the rule. Are we are we are we familiar with the Causeway? Because you should know every road. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I got it right here. <laughs> no, I'm not. Uh, and I'm not familiar with how much it would actually cost. So, Double um, potholes. You know, if it's if it's something reasonable, maybe under five thousand dollars or something like that, we can we can work on that. Yeah, going back in history again, I wasn't here in 1984, but um, on this board in 1984. But I think there was a petition at one time, all the way back then, to repave it, but it didn't pass and it failed. Um, so I'm going to assume that it is not a fully private road and the public does drive on it if it went through that process. I'm going to make that assumption. If we could look at that. We'll validate that. Before yeah, you we'll validate that. Um, they just have some potholes that could, they could use some uh, help with. Um, it'd be great. Hey, um, Commissioner Moore, if, yes, if you could allow me to have a little time. Um, Last week, when my new assistant, Derek, um, started, we did a tour of some of my districts of US-19. And um, I do want to say that we came upon someone passed out at the Wawa bus stop. Um, we passed by it three or four times within an, in an hour, and he never moved. He was laying on the ground behind the bus stop. I had called the sheriff's office. Because frankly, I didn't know if he was alive or not, um, but they were very they were very busy with a, a, a suicide, a, a, an attempted suicide call. And then apparently at my poor Wawa there, someone passed out in the car at the pump. Uh, so they did end up coming to the Wawa, but my guy in the bus stop, outside of the bus stop had moved on. Um, coming up 19 at... Um, the old uh, Buddy Freddy's, I think, or uh, I, what's that restaurant that Rich Beckett used to eat lunch at every day? Mike Wells will know. Bob Evans. Um, it was red. Bob Evans? What was it called? Bob yeah. Evans? The Bob Evans, there were a group of um, people who uh, live outside, I think, and ride around on bike spot in the district. And Morgan, where she watched one of them do some some drugs up their nose. It was a very disturbing drive for a morning. There were some other things too, but um, I'm hopeful that uh, the gentleman who bought the Holiday Mall is offering to give some space to the sheriff's office and to code enforcement and um, free space. And, and make, I'm hoping that maybe a presence more of a presence in that area will help deal with some of this problem. But I did drive um, um, Mike Wells, that, that fishing store that's on 19 that also sells gun ammunition. Do you know what, what intersection that is? The two or three story building? No, armed anglers. I'm not sure what the road is. Yeah, um, I think it might be Sunray. Um, I drove into the biggest pothole uh, within my car because it was underwater. And, there, and so I'm hoping that staff, I just sent Branford an email, but if we're talking about potholes, that one's got to get fixed right away because it's, it's very heavily traveled. It goes underwater frequently, that little corner there. When, when um, the state paid US-19, it made it higher. And there's a dip there, and it just falls apart all the time. And the and the potholes, you can't see them because it's always underwater. So it's a real problem, and I I may have done some damage to my car on that one. Okay, gotcha. All righty, thank you, ma'am. All right, everybody, we're on a little bit of a recess for a while, and we'll see you back here at five fifteen. Thank you. All right, bye.